Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the cell cycle. Okay, so we're currently looking at the transition between G1 phase of the cell cycle and S phase of the cell cycle. We've discussed that throughout G1 uh, phase, you are building up your levels of cyclin D, and the production of cyclin D is activated by uh, the presence of the growth factor that is activating these growth factor receptor downstream pathways. Okay, cyclin D then binds to CDK4 enzymes, cyclin-dependent kinase 4 enzymes. Okay, and this resulting complex, the cyclin D CDK4 complex, is now going to go into the nucleus and it's going to phosphorylate retinoblastoma proteins that are in the nucleus and bound to E2F transcription factors. Now, you have to phosphorylate retinoblastoma protein multiple times in order to get it to release the E2F transcription factor, which means that a certain uh, concentration of cyclin DCDK4 complexes are needed before you get enough phosphate groups attached to the retinoblastoma protein uh, that it releases the E2F transcription factors. Okay, so, um, throughout G1, your cyclin DCDK4 complexes are building in concentration. Once they get to a high enough concentration, retinoblastoma protein will be phosphorylated and it will release the E2F transcription factors. And now the E2F transcription factors are going to bind the promoter regions of a huge number of different genes and cause changes in gene expression. Okay, so we now want to see how these changes in gene expression are going to take you from G1 phase to S phase. Okay, uh, and remember the characteristic change that you go through when you go from G1 to S phase is that you begin the replication of the DNA. Okay, so uh, let's look at the first thing that the E2F transcription factors are going to result in the production of. So, uh, one of the first things I want to talk about is cyclin E. Okay, so another cyclin. So, E2F transcription factors are going to activate the production of cyclin E. So, I will colour in cyclin E here in pink. Now, cyclin E is going to bind to another cyclin-dependent kinase enzyme, and this cyclin-dependent cyclin kinase complex is then going to cause uh, the initiation of DNA replication. Okay, so cyclin E is going to bind to the cyclin-dependent kinase 2. Okay, so I'll show that here. So this is going to represent our cyclin-dependent kinase 2. And just as when we were discussing cyclin-dependent kinase 4, I told you that the cyclin-dependent kinase levels within the cytoplasm uh, do not change throughout the cell cycle. So you always have the cyclin-dependent kinase is present. It's just they're not active when they uh, don't have cyclins bound to them. Okay, so what's now going to happen is the CDK2 here, cyclin-dependent kinase 2, is going to get a cyclin E molecule attaching to it. So here is the cyclin E molecule. And again, I'll colour this in in pink. And this complex now is known as a cyclin E CDK2 complex. Okay. And uh, just like the cyclin D CDK4 complexes had another name, which was the G1 CDK, named after the fact that it was the uh, complex of uh, the G1 phase of the cell cycle. Cyclin E CDK2 complexes are also called G1S CDKs, okay, because they are the um, complex of a cyclin-dependent kinase which is going to uh, be involved in the transition from the first gap phase to the synthesis phase of the cell cycle. Okay, so now we have our cyclin E bound to our CDK2, and these complexes are now going to cause the firing of the origins of replication. Okay, so they are going to cause a huge number of other proteins to bind onto the pre-replication complexes that we were talking about. Okay, so just to remind you, if we've got our double-stranded DNA here, okay, then we know that uh, all the way along our chromosomes, we have these special portions known as origins of replication. 
okay? And all the time, these origins of replication have a complex bound to them, which is the origin recognition complex, or the ORC. Okay, and I'll colour the ORC once again in green. And we know that in the G1 phase of the cell cycle, what we have done is we've synthesised uh, CDC6 proteins, and we've attached these onto the origin recognition complexes, like so. So here are our CDC6 proteins attached onto our origin recognition complexes. Okay, and then uh, once the CDC6 proteins are bound to the origin recognition complexes, other proteins can then bind uh, additionally to the origin recognition complex. Okay, and this one of these main proteins was CDT1. Okay, so here in orange, this is CDT1. And then what bound on top of all of this were these rings, these MCM rings, which consisted of six proteins bound together. And once again, you'll have two of these, one on either side, because remember, the origins are going to fire in either direction. Okay, they're going to fire replication forks in both directions. Okay, so here is our MCM ring on this side, and here is the MCM ring on the opposite side. Okay, so this was the complex of proteins that we assembled in G1 phase, known as the pre-replicative complex, or pre-RC. Now, when you get uh, these G1S CDKs forming uh, at the G1S transition, you're going to get a whole bunch of other proteins adding into this pre-replicative complex, which we're not going to go into, okay? And uh, this will form a larger complex known as the pre-initiation complex, okay? So pre-IC here stands for pre-initiation and then the C is obviously for complex. Okay, right. So, uh, upon the activation of the cyclin E CDK2 complexes, uh, what you're going to get is the pre-replicative complexes over here being transformed into pre-initiation complexes. And these pre-initiation complexes then fire, okay? So you get the process known as origin firing. And this involves DNA polymerase enzymes um, progressing in either direction away from the origin of replication, synthesizing new complementary strands of DNA, i.e. you get the commencement of DNA replication. Okay, so when you get the formation of these cyclin E CDK2 complexes, that's going to cause the firing of the origins of replication. Okay, right. Now, another thing that is um, increased upon these act the activation of these E2F transcription factors is another cyclin. Okay, so I want to discuss this next cyclin. So, the E2F transcription factors also increase the expression level of cyclin A as well as they increase the expression of cyclin E. Okay, so let's now discuss what cyclin A is going to do. So cyclin A, again, is going to uh, bind to a cyclin-dependent kinase. And this time it's again going to bind to cyclin-dependent kinase 2. Okay, so this nicely illustrates the fact that depending on which cyclin you plug into a cyclin-dependent kinase enzyme, the function can differ. Okay, so the... Um, E2F transcription factors increase the expression level of cyclin A, coloured in here in yellow. And cyclin A is now going to bind to cyclin-dependent kinase 2, just like cyclin E did. So let's represent cyclin-dependent kinase 2 here, and we'll colour it in in, I think, turquoise again. Okay, so in turquoise here is cyclin-dependent kinase 2. Right, and now what's going to happen is our cyclin A is going to bind to that, and it's going to uh, now have a different activity profile because it has this different cyclin bound to it. So this cyclin A CDK2 complex will do different things to what the cyclin E CDK2 complexes did. Okay, so that's an important point to understand. Okay, so this complex of cyclin A bound to CDK2 this is known as a cyclin A CDK2 complex, okay? 
or just as the cyclin D, C, D, K4 uh, complexes were called the G1, C, D, Ks, and the cyclin E, C, D, K2 complexes were called the G1, S, C, D, Ks, this one is the main uh, C, D, K complex of S phase, so this is called the S, C, D, K. Okay, right. So this is going to be very important for continuing replication going well. And in addition, it's going to be involved in making sure that you don't copy chromosomes more than once. Okay, because there is a risk that you might, let me show you this, you might take a chromosome like this, replicate it once, okay, and then what's to stop the cell from just ending up replicating one of these again, okay, and ending up with three copies of this chromosome, which would be not good, okay, because that would mean one of the daughter cells would end up with two copies of the chromosome, okay, so you don't want uh, to replicate the chromosomes more than once, but it's difficult to stop that happening because all of the machinery for replication is now present in the nucleus, okay, so once the origins of replication have found what you need to start doing is destroying some of this machinery to make sure that you can't initiate um, replication from the origins of the new chromosomes that you are producing, basically. And it is the cyclin A, C, D, K, 2 complexes that are going to be involved in destroying some of the machinery that's going to stop um, you from being able to fire origins of replication on these new chromosomes here. Okay, so I'll cover these two strands in blue again because they're the new ones. Right, okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to destroy some of the machinery of the pre-replicative complexes. Okay, so um, once the uh, origins have fired, the bit that will be left over, so let me show you what will be left over after an origin fires. Okay, so let's have our double-stranded DNA here again. Okay, here is our origin of replication. Now, once the our origins have fired and the um, DNA is copying, what you will have left over at this new origin of replication, I should say this is a new origin of replication now. So, of course, in reality, what we'll have is two strands now. Okay, so let me show this. Um, so, here we have our new origin of replication on this second strand that we've produced here. Okay, so these were our two original DNA strands that I'll colour in in red here. Okay, one and two. And now we've got these two new strands that are complementary to the original ones. Okay, which I'll show in green here. Okay, now, uh, the first problem is that we've gone from now having one origin of replication to having two. So what will happen is another origin recognition complex will come and bind to the new origin of replication here. So these are our origin recognition complexes here in green. Now, um, we want to stop, basically, um, pre-replicative complexes reforming here, which could then become pre-initiation complexes and fire again. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, we need to stop the CDC6 protein from binding to the orc. Okay, now we do this two ways. Firstly, what we do is we phosphorylate the origin recognition complex. So this is our origin recognition complex here. And remember, it contains many proteins, so we're going to phosphorylate some of the proteins within the origin recognition complex. So here is our phosphate group that's been added on to our origin recognition complexes. Okay, so this is what cyclin A, CDK2 complexes are going to do. They're going to phosphorylate the origin recognition complexes that are on the origins of replication of the two copies of this chromosome that you now have. Okay, and this will stop them from binding to other proteins and starting to form a pre-replication complex. In addition, cyclin A, C, D, K2 complexes are going to phosphorylate C, D, C6, which remember is this protein that initially binds to the origins of replication, and then after that C, D, T1 binds, and then the M, C, M ring binds. Okay, uh, so uh, what you're going to do is you're going to phosphorylate CDC6 proteins. So let's say this is our CDC6 protein here, now with a phosphate group stuck on the side. And what this does 
is it promotes the destruction of CDC6. So once the CDC6 proteins have been phosphorylated, they're going to be destroyed basically by the cell's internal destruction mechanisms. Okay, so CDC6 is going to be wiped out basically because of cyclin A CDK2 complexes phosphorylating it. Now, a slightly nicer fate awaits CDT1. Okay, CDT1 is no longer going to be able to bind to the origin recognition complexes, okay, uh, because firstly, the origin recognition complexes have been phosphorylated, okay, and secondly, there's no CDC6 bound to the origin recognition complexes anymore. And remember, CDT1 bounds to the origin recognition complexes after CDC6 had already bound, so it needed CDC6 to bind first in order to change the origin recognition complexes conformation and allow a, a, a viable binding site to be exposed for CDT1 to bind. 